Friday, July the 1st, marks the 95th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. We're having three days of special coverage to mark the occasion, starting from Wednesday. To understand China, you must understand the CPC. On July the 1st, the Communist Party of China turns 95. For nearly a century, it has led the country from revolution to evolution. China is now the world's second biggest economy, and the CPC one of the world's biggest political parties. What is the key to China's rapid growth? How does the party respond to the challenges? Understand the CPC and its role in China. CCTV News looks at the moments and talks to the people that have made the party what it is today. Welcome to our special program, CPC 95 Years On. When the Chinese Communist Party was founded nearly a century ago, China was preyed upon by colonist powers. And the place the Chinese Communists met for the first time was located within the French settlement. It even did not belong to the Chinese. Now, it is called Xin Tian Di. Literally, it means new heaven and earth. It is a place of high-end restaurants and clubs where the young Chinese hang out to have fun. The rise of China is probably the biggest story of the modern world, and the Chinese communists are at the heart of the narrative. Today, we will revisit the moments the CPC made those choices that charted new courses of the country. China's reform and opening up started with some strong-headed farmers in northern China. Like their forefathers, they were straightforward and bold. But what they did sowed the seeds of change and led to a new economic revolution all over the country. After the nation had been battered by foolhardy policies and political upheaval. Let's turn to Xiaoyue in Anhui province. Yes, in 1978, 18 villagers in Xiaogang village made a secret agreement and divided the villagers' farmland into the family plots. It was an ingenious idea, but was legal at that time. One year later, the village saw a big harvest under the new system, and the initiative was soon rolled out across the country. A few days ago, I came to the village and visited one of the 18 villagers, Mr. Yan Jingchang, who talked about those events. Let's take a look. 73-year-old Yan Jingchang never forgets one winter night 38 years ago. In 1978, he and 17 other villagers in Xiaogang village signed a secret agreement to divide the land of local people's commune into family plots. Before 1978, no matter how much effort you made, everyone got the same pay. So the incentive in terms of production was extremely low. But in 1978, we decided to do something after a severe drought. 18 villagers, including Yan Jingchang, pressed their fingerprints onto a piece of paper with red ink. Act signaled the start of a household contract responsibility system with remuneration linked to production, or what we call Da Bao Gan in Chinese. Two. It was illegal at that time. We didn't know what would happen if the authorities for children in case we were sent to prison. Working for their own family, the villagers were more committed to producing a bumper crop. One year later, Xiaogang village saw a big harvest under the new system. The initiative was soon rolled out across the country. It marked the prelude to the China's rural reforms. 38 years ago, Xiaogang village successfully implemented the rural reforms. Today it was also one of the first to initiate the country's new agricultural reforms that allow families to transfer their farming land to the companies or rural cooperatives. The agricultural reforms are giving new life to the country's oldest industry. Since 2003, nearly 60 percent of rural land has been transferred to villagers in Xiaogang village, including Yan Jingchang. Large-scale and specialized farming methods are being introduced. Yan has since opened a restaurant in his home to entertain people who want to experience local food when traveling to the village. 
One of his customers was none other than Chinese President Xi Jinping, who paid a visit to his restaurant in April. President Xi made a remark last April when he presided over a symposium on rural reform in our village. We promised him that work related to agriculture, rural areas, and farmers will continue to be our priority, and we will do that in the spirit of Da Bao Gan, that is, dare to be the first. Xiaogang Village has experienced tremendous changes since the beginning of rural reforms four decades ago. In 2005, more than 4,000 villagers in Xiaogang made an average annual net income of 14,700 yuan, almost 30 percent higher than the rural average. Xiaogang Village was one of China's poorest villages four decades ago, but has seen rural urbanization unleash economic vitality since the beginning of the rural reform. When President Xi Jinping visited the village in April, he urged that more needs to be done to advance rural reforms and improve modern agricultural industrial systems in the spirit of Xiaogang Village. Back to you. Well, thank you, Richard, for your reporting. And join me now for some discussion and analysis is Professor Wu Guanjun from the Department of Politics at the East China Normal University. Uh, Dr. Wu, after the Cultural Revolution, mm. many people say the Chinese economy was nearly on the brink of collapse. Yep. And why did you think the Chinese Communist Party chose to revamp the economy from the countryside? Mm -hmm. And did that contradict the orthodox communist uh, theory? Well, uh, contradiction is not necessarily a bad thing. In my view, it means like balancing, adjusting, you know, make those uh, ideas or ideologies workable in a concrete, historically concrete uh, environment. So this is actually a huge difference between a, as we discussed, as uh, between a revolutionary party and a ruling party. So actually this, in my view, does not, did not really start uh, from Deng Xiaoping. It, can trace back to Mao, because Mao uh, personally uh, normalized the relation, China's relationship with the U.S. This is actually a, a, a bold move. Mm. So in my view, you know, contradiction is in, already embedded in the CPC's uh, own development. And did it work yeah. well? And mm. did it usher in a new era of mm. economic evolution for China? Uh, it works. Uh, okay, my point is, uh, after the Cultural Revolution, actually what China uh, has is not a uh, clearly stated uh, political program. So it improvises and it makes a lot of you know, various experiments and uh, let, you know, the ch China is a huge big uh, country and uh, Deng's idea is let those, all those various experiments mm. okay. to compete, to have, let's see the results, why not? Mm. So in my view it works quite well actually you know we have mm. seen the results of the economic growth and you're now watching a special program on cctv news on the 95th anniversary of cpc on july the first the communist party of china turns 95. for nearly a century it has led the country from revolution to evolution china is now the world's second biggest economy and the CPC, one of the world's biggest political parties. What is the key to China's rapid growth? How does the party respond to the challenges? Understand the CPC and its role in China. CCTV News looks at the moments and talks to the people that have made the party what it is today. While China's economic stability relies in agriculture and the countryside, but the country's economy took off somewhere else. It is from there the Chinese communists showed their grit and wit to remake the Chinese economy. And also, it forever changed the face of China. Now, let's turn to Wu Lei in Shenzhen. Well, behind me is a statue of late Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping, who first initiated opening up policy here in Shenzhen over three decades ago. At that time, Shenzhen was nothing but a cluster of fishing villages. But today, as you can see from all these modern buildings and skyscrapers, Shenzhen has become one of the most developed cities in China. In fact, its GDP per capita ranks first among major Chinese cities. Other than Shenzhen, no city in China 
has been built yet into such a large scale within a short period of time. This is an old picture of the fisherman's village in Shenzhen in the early 1980s. At that time, fishing was the only way of life for the villagers. 49-year-old Wu Songqiu was born in this village. He said there was no other means to earn money. But after the reform and opening up policy, they became more free. Thanks to the opening up policy, we encourage business from Hong Kong by building factories and manufacturing for them. We also ship sands and bricks on the Shenzhen River for the construction market. This was how we earned our first pot of gold. Through years of development, the fisherman's village has turned into a modern community. Local villagers have also set up a company, Shenzhen Yufeng Industrial Shares, which mainly deals with their property and renting businesses. Now each family can earn around 400,000 yuan or 63,000 US dollars per year. Since Shenzhen was named the country's first special economic zone in 1980, the speedy construction of the city is something of a miracle. In the 1980s, there were very few ships and containers at Tiantian port. But today, it has changed beyond recognition. In 2015, its handling capacity reached over 12 million standard-sized containers with around 100 international lines shipping to countries across the world each week. Yantian Port is one of the major ports in Shenzhen. President of the Yantian Port Group, Liu Nan'an, said the port's fast growth attributed to the strong leadership of the Communist Party of China. The party's reform and opening up policy gave life to Yantian Port. Now our port accounts for half of the whole Shenzhen port's handling capacity, which reached over 24 million standard-sized containers ranking the third largest in the world in 2015. With more favorable policies like the One Belt and One Rule initiative, we will increase our investment and make more progress. Between 1980 and 2015, Shenzhen maintained average annual growth rate of 23 percent. It also cultivated many big enterprises like ZTE, Tencent and China Merchants Bank. The city is also home to about 20 million people. For them, this metropolis is a land of opportunity and miracles. Shenzhen's success can be seen as an example of the transition from a planned economy to a socialist market economy. The grand experiment of the Communist Party of China on the socialist market economy has kicked off the economic miracle that deeply changed China's face in the past three decades. Back to you. Let's go back to our discussion with Dr. Wu. Uh, Dr. Wu, how important is it for mm. the CPC to open up China's economy mm. to the outside world in the 1970s and 80s, especially to foreign capital and also technology? So apparently, it made China to catch up the you know the world, the pace of the world's development. But also, uh, my analysis is at that time the leadership. They did not have you know, a clearly stated program in their mind. They do not know what kind of consequence by opening up. You know. But they, uh, they, are, uh, they have one thing you know, sure, it, which is the status quo at that time. You know, after, you know, yeah, I agree with you. It's a, it was at the verge of you know, total breaking down. So they need change. They need further development. By opening up, it allowed China to uh, to self-reforming, so in that way, you know, to allow many new innovative uh, experiments. So this is the uh, masterful move for of Deng Xiaoping. Mm. Uh, he allows different, you know, experimentation, and he sets aside ideological debates. Mm -hmm. So in this way, you know, China has the opportunity mm. to be different. And talking about the debate, yep. the transition from a planned economy, many mm. believe is the hallmark mm. of communist country to a market right. economy. Right. It hasn't been easy. And some people say we're still transitioning. Mm. Where mm. did it begin and where we are now? Okay, I won't uh, offer you a historical account. But the thing is, we have seen the, all the problems of a 
total planned economy. And we start to see the limits of a market you know, economy. So we are trying to uh, actually move in between to find a balancing point. And this is the beauty of China's reform. Mm. It do, as I stated, it do not has a clearly stated program. Mm. It can adjust itself to you know what it's the, the current challenges, you mm. know, the current situations. It can quickly adjust itself and to you know to develop more you know like uh, minor uh, other administrative means to make things different. Another big story is, of course, yeah. the impact of China's economy on the mm. rest of the world, uh, yeah. especially after China joined the World Trade Organization right, right, right. in 2001. Back then, China's mm. GDP was roughly 4% of the global total. Now it's 12%. Mm. And now China is number one trader in the world. So how much do you think China's economic growth has changed the world? Ah, oh, greatly, greatly. Of course, uh, China certainly changed how the you know the world economy you know the, the how the game you know, the whole game, and also China is changing with it. So I also want to emphasize it. because China is you know like in my uh, as I stated, it does not really you know it contributing while also self you know changing. So, but also change the rest yeah, of the world. A now it becomes an integral part of the world economy. It becomes so essential to it. So this is, in my view, the China's contribution. It's not like say, okay, I have something, you know, like a, a, a concrete, concrete right. plan. Then, okay, the rest of the world have to follow it. But it's changing okay. with it. Thank you. And you're now watching a special program on CCTV News on the 95th anniversary of CPC. On July the 1st, the Communist Party of China turns 95. For nearly a century, it has led the country from revolution to evolution. China is now the world's second biggest economy, and the CDC one of the world's biggest political parties. What is the key to China's rapid growth? How does the party respond to the challenges? understand the CPC and its role in China. CCTV News looks at the moments and talks to the people that have made the party what it is today. When the 13 Chinese communists met for the first time in 1921 to establish their party, the city of Shanghai was a half colony, half a burgeoning capital city, while the average Chinese still struggles on the street for a hard life. Almost a century later, Shanghai has become one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world and harbors even bigger ambitions. Our only Nan was at the iconic waterfront. This is the Bund, the landmark waterfront in Shanghai for centuries. It began as a British settlement after the Opium Wars in the 1840s. Other foreign nations soon followed suit, creating what is called the international settlements. At the start of the 20th century, the bond developed into a major financial hub of East Asia, housing some of the biggest global banks and trading houses. This area became home to the British and Russian consulates. Colonial powers not only changed China's political landscape, but also its economy. This concession was actually countries within a country. Very few Chinese people were allowed inside. Western capitals created massive wealth on this land, pillaging fortune from China rather than bringing it prosperity. After the CPC established the People's Republic of China in 1949, many financial institutions left gradually, but most of them returned following China's reform and opening up policies in 1978. Shanghai reopened its doors to other countries, but this time China was making rules on market economy and financial orders. On the other side of the Huangpu River, it's a whole new world. In just two decades, a Chinese Manhattan has emerged. It's a Pudong new era. 
China has become the world's second largest economy, and its businesses are integrated with the global economy like never before. Some of the world's most powerful corporations have set up their headquarters in Shanghai, including the BRICS Development Bank. Chinese officials created the Shanghai Free Trade Zone three years ago to improve the country's trading and foreign investment environment. Disney has just spent 5.5 billion U.S. dollars building its new Shanghai Disney Resort, by far the largest foreign investment in the city. The bond is a witness of China's turbulent history. It's a mirror reflecting how the CPC drove away colonist invaders and remade China's economy and society. And it will continue to watch over the future of the country and the party. Lin Nan, CCTV, Shanghai. The Chinese Communist Party convened its 18th National Congress in 2012. The new leadership has some grand strategic plans. One of the ideas to emerge from the Congress was the One Belt One Road Initiative, which is aimed at bringing about stronger connectivity in the world. But what exactly is this plan, and what will be its implications? Let's turn to Han Peng for more. Han Peng. Globalization is a term invented by the capitalist countries, but is now being embraced by the Communist Party of China to boost the country's economy. This is reflected in the recent One Belt One Road initiative, which aims to build a Silk Road economic belt and a 21st-century maritime Silk Road. That's the latest global strategy unveiled by the then newly elected party leader Xi Jinping in 2013. The ancient Silk Road conjures images of romance and adventure, with merchants crossing the continent to deliver exotic products. And today, China is trying to revive the ancient trade routes. China and Central Asia should join hands to build a Silk Road economic belt and boost cooperation. We should work to improve traffic connectivity so as to open the strategic region through fare from the Pacific Ocean to the Baltic Sea. To see how people are responding to the ambitious goal, we took a journey along the ancient Jews and talked to people on the way. From Beijing to Istanbul, in many landlocked regions, some of which were almost forgotten in the modern era of maritime trade, there is a newfound optimism. Apparent in almost all walks of life. I want to visit、uh, the, your country. I can meet the people there, and then I can make、uh, more business. You know,、uh, Iran can play、uh, an important role in linking the land and sea routes of the Silk Road together. Led by the Communist Party, China is embracing globalization like never before. Reviving the Silk Road is just one of its recent global strategies. To realize the ambitious goal, the Communist Party is learning from some capitalist practices, adopting market principles at home, and setting up banks. The reason why the Belt and Road Initiative has so well received is because it has addressed the needs of many countries and people along the way. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank will support the initiative according to the rules set by the bank's board of directors. But China's first encounter of globalization came with pain and humiliation in the 19th century. To learn about that part of history, we took another journey into the past. The old Summer Palace in Beijing was once a majestic royal garden. It was robbed and burned down in 1860 by the invading British and French armies during the Second Opium War. At the time, China, ruled by an emperor, was largely closed to the international market. The Western powers, armed with advanced weaponry, forced China to open its ports and surrender some of sovereignty and trade. The ruins of the old Summer Palace has been a silent testament of China being invaded. Colonialized and forced into the global capitalist market, the palace was destroyed in 1860, the same year when the American Civil War started, and 61 years before the Communist Party of China was established. In 1921, the Communist Party was set up in the flames of wars and uprisings, and now, on the 95th anniversary of its establishment, the Communist Party of China is presiding over the world's second-largest economy and the biggest manufacturer and exporter. From being forced to open its market to actively going global, it took nearly a century for the Communist Party of China to turn history around. 
but on the Belt and Road, it took less than three years for changes to happen along the way. China's embracement of globalization didn't come easily. It started with over a billion people toiling in the labor-intensive factories to produce low-cost export goods for decades. As an official put it, China has to export over 800 million T-shirts to buy one airplane from the United States. But that helped the Chinese to accumulate enough capital to dream bigger. Today, the Communist Party of China is leading the country to restructure its economy in the hope of making Made in China brand stronger around the world. Well, thank you, Han Pong, for your reporting. And now let's turn back to our discussions with Dr. Wu. Well, Dr. Wu, what do you make of China's economic growth mm -hmm. potential? And do you think the so-called One Belt, One Road initiative will keep China's economic engine revving? My view is, uh, in terms of uh, economic growth, uh, this might not be a long-term solution. But the, the beauty of this is it creates a new focus. Mm -hmm. It shows the world, and also it's uh, chi the Chinese people, China has potential to do things in a different way, to keep its, you know, as you said, the economic engine mm -hmm. running. It creates a lot of markets, new markets. And also, if this plan works out, it did something, it can do something in a wonderful way. So this is my take on this. Uh, and some say this strategy mm. actually reflects China's efforts to remake the international order. And mm. it is a competition against the US mm. to set the rules of trade and commerce. Mm. Do you agree? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. You know, in the political theory, there's of course a theory called hegemony. So it means you know, different uh, country competing in uh, de uh, defining rules. So in my view, the rules, you know, there's, there's no you know, perfect rules. Rules are to be followed, but also rules are to be changed, to be improved. I think the participants, the participation of China into the world it changed the rules in a good way. Mm -hmm. It made the world a multipolar world. It, the, the United States, of course, they want to uh, they want to emphasize this kind of view. You know, like China is like try to change the game, but it fails to address. Actually, China makes the world a multipolar. The, there's no one country can make all shorts. Mm. So in this way, I think China do make the world a more just more just. Just world. a place. It would more just world. Yeah, more, bring more justice into the world. All right. Thank so. you so much. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Well, on the report card of the CPC, economic growth is the most highlighted score, but it did not come easily. The Chinese communists have paid the price for mistaken prices, but they've learned their lessons and proved themselves to be a resilient and adaptive political force by delivering two decades of continued growth. But can China continue to be the envy of the world? And will it address the problems in economic transition, social justice, or the environment? We'll have more analysis tomorrow. And thanks for joining us on this special program, CPC 95 Years Old.